Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Grant Glover, and I am the college pastor here at PCBC, and I also work with our young adults at our Tuesday night ministry called Off the Clock. And this morning, we're going to be continuing on in our I Am series, where we're looking at the statements that Jesus makes about himself and the implications that has for us. And since I am preaching this morning, I decided that since I am a zillennial, pause, for those of us born between years 95 and 98, we're kind of in between the cutoff between being Gen Z or millennial, so we have an identity crisis, so we call ourselves zillennials. Now, because I'm a zillennial, I decided I would have to start this morning by explaining a meme trend to everybody, and it's one called Le Cap. Now, for my older friends in the room, if I say that's cap to you, that means I'm saying you're lying, you're faking, you're bluffing. Now, follow me. If you combine LeBron James and cap, you get le cap. This sermon is highly educational. Now, the reason that LeBron James has earned this nickname is because there are lots of interviews recently where he has been caught totally faking his knowledge about things. The one that really got this kicked off was he was being interviewed by a British TV show in the midst of the World Cup, and LeBron owns 2% of Liverpool Football Club, an English team, and one of the players, Jordan Henderson, plays for England. And they asked him if he was proud to see one of his players score in the World Cup, and this is what LeBron said. He goes, yeah, I didn't watch the game, but I, I, I saw the clip. And it was cool to see him score against, to score in the match. He had no idea who England was playing. He didn't watch the game. He's LeBron James. He has more important things to do. Now, NBA Twitter had a field day with this because of all the things that he has done this similarly. And somebody who has too much time on their hands dug up an old interview of him talking about the night in the early 2000s where Kobe scored 81 points. And this is what LeBron said in the interview. He says, this is like he's like probably in high school at the time. He says, yeah, I was with my friends the day Kobe scored 80. Before the game, I told them, I think he's going to get 70. And then when he hit 70 at the game, I told them, sitting with him, like, I think he might go for 80. And the internet trolls came out in droves and decided to start making memes of this interview of all the things LeBron James claims to know. And so I have a sample of memes for you. First one up, here's LeBron. Here's a clip of him in the interview where it starts off with, so I told Mark Zuckerberg, drop the the and just call it Facebook. It sounds better. So we start traveling back in time of things LeBron claims to know and can influence. And of course, with memes, things get more absurd and out of hand. So we keep backtracking. And the next one is, uh, I remember telling Earl Woods that Tiger should play golf. <laughs> I saw Tiger grab his binky, and I just knew he was going to be a golfer. <laughs> Tiger seven years older than LeBron, if you didn't know. So you can see where this is going. And then, again, it's the internet. Things progress, and finally we get this one where he says, I remember the morning the Titanic departed from England. I was supposed to be on that ship. They call it unsinkable, but I had a bad feeling. <laughs> and then we keep traveling back in time. And lastly, this is for you Hamilton fans out there. He says in this meme, I remember telling Alexander Hamilton and the boys, y'all need to write a new document for the U.S. government. And right after that, they wrote the Constitution, and I just knew it would work. <laughs> and I'm glad you laughed at that, because I made that last meme. <laughs> I am a millennial. You got to own it. So here's the thing, though. The reason this is funny is because in America, we think that people who are rich and famous, like LeBron James or Elon Musk, are supposed to know everything about everything, that they can't be caught not knowing something when they're being interviewed. And what's funny is that we are no different in Dallas. We're the same way. We hate the idea of looking incompetent or behind to people. It's why when people ask me, do you like blank band, I say, yeah, man, they're the best. Because I don't want to seem uncool. I'm a millennial. I'm supposed to be caught up on things. And most of the time, I'm not. 
And we really, we really feel like we have to put on a front as knowledgeable people, that we have to be put together people, always ready to answer questions the right way and look the right way to the right people. But if that's your whole life, think of the stress. Because if you live that way, you're always afraid of the next joke not landing, the next connection not working out, you're afraid the next person might not like you, or to be found out to be a fake, a le cap. So the question is, in this world where we are expected to have so much knowledge because of the access to the internet, but most of the time we are unknowledgeable, and in a world where there are lots of questions we have and not always great answers, what do we do? Where do we find guidance, and how do we deal with this idea of not wanting to feel incompetent? We're going to find that answer in John 10, 10 through 18, the passage that Han read for us. And in it, we're going to see Jesus calling himself the good shepherd. So you can turn to your Bibles in John 10. And in this passage, we're going to see three things. The need for a shepherd, the love of the shepherd, and the trust in the shepherd. Need, love, and trust. We'll follow this as we look at the passage. So first, what we have to see actually is the need for a shepherd. This is the need we have that at our core, we are actually needy. And what Jesus is saying is that we are dependent. And he explains this for us clearly in the passage, if you pick up on the metaphor. Look at verse 11, which will be on the screen as well. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus is saying he's a shepherd and we're sheep. And at first glance, this sounds kind of comforting, this idea that like we're like cute little sheep that Jesus picks up and cuddles and like pats on the head and gives treats to. But that's not the case. If you know the context, if you understand the context that he's coming from, it's kind of an insult, honestly. And Jeff did a great job last week of explaining this when he showed a video showing how dumb sheep are where there was one stuck in a rut, they pulled him out, and he ran and then jumped right back in it. And everyone laughed in here. And as I'm sitting there listening to the sermon, knowing I had to preach on this this week, I, had to, I decided that I needed to do some research and decide how dumb are sheep really. So I found myself in the bowels of the internet on sheep blogs and forums. <laughs> Those exist. And it turns out, I didn't know this. There's a debate out there about sheep's intelligence. And it turns out there are people who I have coined sheep advocates, sheep allies, who <laughs> argue that sheep are smarter than you think. It's smarter than you give them credit for. They say that they're pack animals. They can remember other sheep. They can read emotions. But then they have this really, really good point about why sheep are smarter than you think. According to raisingsheep.net, it's a real website. <laughs> An adamant sheep defender says the reason that sheep are smarter than you think is that science has shown they have the same IQ as cows. <laughs> Roll clip. Now, Jeff shows a video of sheep last week, and here's a video of cows from a cow farmer that I can't uh, play the audio that he has because of some colorful language, but you notice the first two cows find the food easily, and then there's this third cow. It's always a third for some reason. Parents with children understand this. And this third cow finds the impenetrable wall of a wooden beam that he just watched his buddy walk through, and he now cannot get to the food. Being compared to a cow is not a compliment. <laughs> sheep are, yes, smarter than, say, squirrels. I'll give them that. But that's like saying I have more hair than Pastor Jeff. <laughs> it's true, but it's not saying much. I have permission to say that joke because I asked for it, because <laughs> he is my boss. And secondly, I have a receding hairline, so at least we can bond over that. And as I look downwards at the Bible, you can really see it. Now, 
According to one sheep blogger who's not a sheep defender, he's actually a you know, farmer of sheep, he, he explains how dumb sheep really are, and he says that like, they will go eat poisonous things if you're not careful. Like You have to really guide them to where they're eating because they will just go eat things that will kill them. And he says that he's observed sheep when they get separated from the flock. So imagine just like a flock over there and 100 yards, one sheep by himself. They get so confused and disoriented that they just like walk in circles and then die. Kind of morbid, but like sheep are dumb. They just are. There's no way around it. And so as Jesus explains this metaphor, him being a shepherd and we're sheep, what he's saying is in a non-condescending way, we like sheep are needy. That we're needy. But here's the problem. If, if he's saying that we need someone to care for us at all times, to protect us, to watch us, to feed us and guide us, we don't like that. We don't like the idea of needing someone. We like the idea of being needed. And we feel that it's important to be self-sufficient. So here in Dallas, there are some Dallasites who feel sufficient, self-sufficient in their status and their social circles and the cars and houses they own and memberships. And I'll hear people like that say things like, I don't need counseling. That's for people who need help. I'm not saying everyone needs counseling, but everybody needs some kind of help. Everybody's got problems. And I also, I'll hear there are some Dallasites who feel put together due to their church participation. And you'll sit and listen to sermons with a yawn in your head because you feel like you know everything already about the Bible and there's no point in listening. And you might be the kind of person that's always giving advice that nobody asked for. And Here's the thing, I fall in this category too because as someone with a theology degree, you could ask my friends and family who are seated right there, that I think I know everything about everything theology and Bible related and think I have all the answers and I certainly do not. If I'm going to take the words of Jesus seriously, if we are going to take it seriously, if he's the shepherd, then I'm a sheep, a needy sheep. We're all needy sheep. This is what we have to see, that we have a need for a shepherd, that we don't see ourselves as needy, even though when you boil us down, we really are like sheep. And notice that a shepherd, think about this, a shepherd is not in a sheep's life to be his or her personal assistant, to be there occasionally. A shepherd is there to completely control and help guide the entire sheep's life. And the reason so many people in Dallas miss the good shepherd is because they think they don't need someone to reorient their entire life, that they mostly have it together. But we do. It's actually a relief, if you really think about it, if the idea that we're needy and we're dependent on someone, if that's true, that means we can all drop the act. We don't have to le cap our way through life. And we can finally recognize that we are needy and need help. And this is not just in a sin sense, in the sense that we do bad things. It's the sense that we have a, in our whole lives, holistically, we are needy. We are not the arbiters of wisdom, of complete knowledge of the Bible, of how church should be run, of how to parent, how to be a spouse, how to work, how to invest. We're sheep. And when you really think about it, you know this better than anybody else because you know the deepest thoughts in your mind, the ones you would not like anybody else to hear. You know your flaws. You know what happens in your darkest moments. And what you lack when nobody is watching and there's no front to put on. If Jesus is the good shepherd who is all-knowing and all-powerful, it would be best to see ourselves as needing him and not relying on ourselves and all things up and trying to keep up the act. So the question is, when you really think about it, do you see yourself as needy? Actually needy. No matter what your title is, no matter what your job description is, do you see yourself as needy? A good litmus test for that is what is your prayer life like? How needy do you feel like you are? What is prayer's role in your life? 
Because that's a good indicator of what it means to be dependent and to need God. Is he just someone you talk to before meals and when things get bad? Or someone you recognize you need a lot? Are you needy in your marriage? Are you needy at your job? Are you needy in dealing with that one family member that you just can't stand and are having a hard time dealing with? Or do you think you have to have all the answers? Friends, it's a relief to see ourselves as needy because then we actually can admit we don't have all the answers, nor do we need to because Jesus is not being condescending here. He's stating reality, and what he's actually doing is setting up this idea that our neediness is actually a good thing because this will be our second point, the love of the shepherd. What you have to see is that even though This is who we are, that we are, in a sense, holistically needy. There's something different about this shepherd that actually calms and answers our deepest thoughts. Because Jesus doubles down on this idea in verse 14 where he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Here is Jesus saying, yeah, I'm the shepherd. And yes, sheep are needy needy and dependent but I want them. I want to know them. And while we may be like sheep who are needy and think we can make it on our own, Jesus is not an ordinary shepherd. Because look at what happens at verse 11. It says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now you have to understand the context of that. Because what's astonishing about this claim is how far Jesus is willing to go. Because back then, shepherds were not willing to really risk their lives for the sake of the flock. Because if they died, sheep are helpless without a shepherd. So, there's even these Jewish writings that says, if one wolf comes to attack the flock, defend them. If two wolves come, run. That was the Jews' advice to shepherds. And so a shepherd would never, on purpose, die for sheep. He said he would only do it on accident. But look at what Jesus, the good shepherd, says in verses 17 and 18. He says, I lay down my life of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. Don't miss what he's saying here. He's saying he's looking at the needy sheep, the inconvenient, needy, dependent sheep, And he says, I will take on the lowly role of the shepherd who I will guide them and protect them. And ultimately, I will die for them. He puts in more work for us than we put in for him, than we could ever put in for him. And the best way to illustrate this, a good way to illustrate this, is from the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Who all has seen it in the room? Okay, I need way more hands up. That's your homework for the week. So... This movie came out a few years ago and was nominated for an Academy Award. Stars Andrew Garfield, who was Spider-Man in the second of the Spider-Man movies. And it's a true story, you can look this up, about a man named Desmond Doss, who at the outbreak of World War II, he lived in a small town in Virginia, and he was not drafted to be in the army, but he enlisted himself because he saw all of his friends doing the same. But here's the catch. He was a conscientious objector, which means he did not believe in violence and that he did not want to pick up a gun and run into battle and shoot people with it. But he still wanted to be in the army. And as you can imagine, back in that time, that did not sit well with the troop. As he arrives at boot camp and his troop begins to figure this out, they begin to bully him, name-calling him, shaming him, They do also all sorts of things, like mocking him, spitting on him. And they even beat him up one night in his bed and just call him a coward constantly. And even worse, he almost gets court-martialed and arrested for this because he was disobeying the lieutenant's orders by not picking up a gun. So he almost spent World War II in jail for not being willing to pick up a gun and fight. But after much debate... The judge says he was allowed to go free and run into the heat of battle without a single weapon to protect him. And he does, because his troop goes off to fight in the Battle of Okinawa, which was against the Japanese. And what happened was there was this massive ridge called Hacksaw Ridge, 
And on top of it is where the battle took place, and the Americans had to climb up over the ridge to get up to where the Japanese were. And Desmond runs up this ridge with his troop, and for three days, while his troop is getting slaughtered, not doing well, hurt, Desmond spends three days rescuing injured soldiers and ends up rescuing 75 soldiers over the course of three days. Even though he takes bullet wounds himself, the movie doesn't show this because the writers thought it would be too unrealistic. The audiences wouldn't believe it, but he did. He, took, he fractured his arm in the midst of all of this, and he was lowering people down with the rope down the ridge. The men who bullied him, who called him a coward, he prayed for, and in an interview in 2006, when he was still alive, he said that every time he saved someone, he prayed in his Virginian accent, please, Lord, let me save one more, just one more. Now, last service, people told me my Virginian accent stinks, but I'm standing by it. <laughs> Look, that right there, when you watch the movie, he ends up getting the Medal of Honor, and you can't help but weep when you watch this man sacrifice his life. And that right there is Jesus. Our hearts are moved by stories like Desmond, and they have to be moved by the story of Jesus because he also steps into enemy territory for people who don't feel like they need him, for people who don't are inconvenient to him, and he willingly puts up his life so dumb sheep can be saved. This is the love of the shepherd that our neediness does not trigger disappointment, but triggers his love. And that is an important point to make in a distinction about Christianity that makes it unique. Because we think that if we admit that we're mess-ups, that we're needy and dependent, that Jesus won't want us, and he'll be frustrated with us. Friends, that's religion. What the gospel says, the gospel is the opposite. Our neediness, the fact that we are needy, triggers the compassion of Christ to come and die for us. Because for the shepherd back then, the sheep would have been, his flock would have been his wealth. It would have been his net worth. And Jesus is then saying the same thing, that my wealth is wrapped up in you. You are my pride. You are my joy. I come to give my life willingly for you. He considers us needy sheep to be a source of joy for him. And once you see your own neediness, you can't help but have your heart melted by the immense love the shepherd shows in willingly laying down his life. And that's why he says then in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. And friends, that could be somebody in the room today. Friends, in the gospel, it's all backwards. That the more you see how needy you are, the more you see how loved by Christ you are. They go hand in hand. If you think you're too far gone, too unworthy, that you're needy, that means you get it. All you need is need. What you bring to the shepherd is need, and he gives you his life to rescue you. That is the love of the shepherd, and the more you see your need, the more you see his love, they go hand in hand. Now, there's still a question that remains, because a lot of people feel this way, that, Grant, I feel like I am the wandering sheep who's just, like, doesn't belong in the flock. Like, I'm the black sheep I'm constantly wandering, and I think I'm just a little too inconvenient for this shepherd. I'm not like other sheep. This we will address in our third point, the trust in the shepherd. And this is a point that has been lost in modern American evangelicalism. Many modern Christian circles miss this, but you have to see what Jesus is saying here. Because people in the room, there are many who have to hear it. We're going to skip down to verses 27 through 29, where Jesus continues the metaphor, and he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, 
and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Couple observations here. Jesus is saying that because he lays his life down for the sheep, he's not just talking about eternal life in the future in heaven, but abundant life now. A holistic sense of life, not prosperity, wealth, and health, but a sense of being in perfect relationship with God. And he says that this life, which satisfies all of our deepest desires, will never perish. And the Greek grammar behind the word never is the strongest negation, the strongest way to negate something in the Greek language. It's putting two words that mean no back to back, u and may. And so it literally means they will no, no perish. In other words, they will never, ever, under any circumstances, perish. He can't say it in his language any stronger. But the question is, how is that possible? And he says, it's because they're in my hand. They're, anyone who's in the hand of my father will not be able to be snatched out. And in Greek thought, much like today, the hand of a man was thought to be where he exercises his power through. The king and his kingdom was the power of his hand. And he is saying that in my hand, as the all-powerful God, no one can snatch me. And so that means once you're in God's hands, once you have given yourself and said, I believe the good shepherd is enough to forgive me, you cannot be lost. He will protect you from everything that would snatch him away from you. And that includes yourself. Because needy sheep, not even the sheep can do anything about being in the Father's hand. And a lot of you have to hear this today because you might carry lots of fears and insecurities because of being burned in the past. Perhaps you have been burned or rejected by a spouse, by a coworker, a friend boyfriend, girlfriend, relative, whatever it is, and you wonder if anyone can be trusted, you might think that you are just too dumb of a sheep, too much of a failure for God to actually truly love. And you need to hear this today, that there is a trust that you can have in the shepherd, that in his hands, there is nothing we can do to lose him. Now, let me answer the question that's in some of your heads. You may be asking, what about this person I knew that said they were a Christian and then renounced their faith? And these are good questions, and these are based on life experiences and anecdotal and should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you'd like to talk about it, people here are willing to talk with you later. But we're not talking about life experiences. What we're talking about is the text, God's word, where he says, they will never, ever perish when they are in my hands. The scripture is clear on this, and that's why people back then, older theologians, understood this better than we do today, and it's kind of a doctrine that we have got to reclaim if we're really going to be a grace-centered people. The old theologian, uh, Puritan theologian, Thomas Goodwin, put it this way. He says, Christ's joy, comfort, happiness, and glory are increased and enlarged by what goes in that blank? Dressing nice when you go to church, reading your Bible, praying more. Here's what Thomas Goodwin says. Christ's joy, comfort, happiness, and glory are enlarged by and increased by showing grace and mercy. In pardoning, relieving, and comforting his members, believers here on earth. Jesus exists to forgive. The same Jesus who gives his life for the flock that you put your faith in is the same Jesus who walks with you now. It's not like he dies for you and then gets frustrated because you're a dumb sheep. That Jesus does not change. The same good shepherd who willingly lays down his life is the same one with you now. And this idea pops up over and over again throughout the Bible. And a powerful example of that is in John 6, where Jesus says, whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And the same Greek construction is behind that word never. The same no-no idea. It means they will ne I will never, ever cast them out. And Charles Spurgeon was an old Baptist theologian in London in the 1800s. 
And he encountered many people who doubted whether or not they belonged in Christianity or whether or not they could be saved. In his conversations, he summarized like this. He said, the first sinner would say, I feel that I have not repented enough and that I'm not broken enough over my sin. The second sinner would say, I feel that I have not had enough emotional experiences that I see other people having. The third sinner says, I feel like I don't have enough faith. And here was Spurgeon's response. Does Jesus say whoever repents enough, I will never cast out? Whoever has enough emotional experiences? Whoever has enough faith? No, Jesus says whoever comes to me, I will never ever cast out. Now again, some of you are thinking in your heads, yes, but faith without works is dead and you're right. Genuine faith in Christ will lead to genuine obedience. It will lead to a transformed life. God accepts you where you are, but he does not want to leave you there. But the New Testament, if you read it very carefully, never puts a level on how much obedience is expected, how many things are expected to be done. And Tim Keller puts it this way for people who struggle with this concept. He says, if you, know, if you think that knowing you're totally secure in his love and can't be unloved again, if you think that destroys the motivation and incentive for living a moral life, then the only incentive you ever had was fear and self-interest. Hear him clearly. What he's saying is many people say, well, if God just forgives everyone, why can't I live however I want? Well, if that's how you think, then that means that if you think a gospel of grace results in an unchanged life, then you're under the impression that the only way to live a changed life is being afraid that God might punish you and that you might not be good enough. Whereas a melting of the heart by the gospel of grace is actually what transforms the life of the flock. And this is the trust we can have in the shepherd. That, my friends, is the call of the good shepherd. He says that I see your need, I lay my life down for you, and you are in my hands now, and so what's our response? Rest in his hands. Relax in knowing that if you're a believer, you're in the hands of someone who leaves the 99 to go after the one black sheep, brings him back, and then throws a party saying, look, I found the dumb one. That's the kind of person we follow. That's the kind of person we're in relationship with. To rest in his hands is simply to respond to what he did to make you his to go from a prayer life that is centered around meals or when you're in trouble to an all-encompassing prayer life because you're needy and you know he's listening and he's not frustrated. And that's why, again, another thing to rest in his hands, that's why we're doing, as a church family, dwell. Where we're walking through the Gospel of John together and everyone who is taking this bookmark and reading through it as a church family, is encountering the Jesus of the Bible throughout John and being reminded constantly, day by day, that there is a good shepherd whose hands we are in and we do not have to have it all together because he had it all together. That is the gospel. And friends, the reason oftentimes American evangelicalism can look, be looked down upon is because we have lost sense of just how much the shepherd continues to love and forgive we don't see ourselves as needy constantly, so we're not humble. We don't see the immense love of the shepherd constantly, so we don't see how much we ought to love and forgive others back. We get caught up in questions like, can you do blank and be a, a Christian? When the real question we should be asking is, is Jesus able to forgive a sinner? And the answer is yes. It doesn't mean there aren't questions about people, but it's not, your, it's not our role to ask some of those questions. What we do is proclaim the love of a shepherd who dies for dumb sheep, who will lay his life down for those who are constantly needy, and that never changes. And I will end right now with a poem that brought me to tears when I first read it in the book Gentle and Lowly. And I know someone in this room needs to hear it today. It's from an old theologian named John Bunyan, and he writes about a conversation between a doubting person and Jesus. And here's how it goes. Hear these words. But I am a great sinner, say you. I will never cast out, says Christ. But I am an old sinner, say you. 
I will never cast out, says Christ. But I'm a hard-hearted sinner. I will never cast out. But I'm a backsliding sinner. I will never cast out. But I have sinned against light. I will never cast out. But I have sinned against mercy. I will never cast out. But I have no good thing to bring with me. I will never, ever cast out, says Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for sending your son to be the good shepherd for us, that you see our neediness and it triggers nothing but love on your response, that you show us how much you love us by dying for us, that if we put our faith in what you did, that you becoming a sacrificial lamb is enough to make us children of God. That if we put our faith in that you were good enough, we don't have to worry about us being good enough. That we can see our neediness and it can only draw us towards your love, to the gospel and a changed heart. And that we can trust you, that we are in your hands and nothing, not even ourselves, can snatch us away from that. Let us rest in that today. Find our complete joy, satisfaction in you. And find all of our needs being met by you, our good shepherd. In your name I pray. Amen.